Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The parable that we hear today, well, it can be pretty dangerous if it's misunderstood. A rich man's steward, his business manager, the man in charge of all of his business and goods, is called before his manager, his master, excuse me, because he's been wasting his master's goods. And Jesus doesn't say how precisely, but you can imagine it's on himself, selfishly, for the sake of his own gain, for the sake of his own good. And when word comes to the rich man that his steward is misusing his goods, he calls the steward into his office and tells him to bring the books with him because he can no longer serve as steward. He has been unfaithful to his stewardship and unfaithful to his master. The steward, who up to this point has had no problem whatsoever ripping his master off, decides he's going to do it one last time. He doesn't want to provide for himself by digging, after all, who would if they had the opportunity not to? He doesn't want to beg, again, who can blame him? So he calls in every one of his master's debtors while he is still steward, while he still has the ledger, and he cancels large portions of their debts. One, Jesus says, owes a hundred measures of oil. That guy gets a 50% discount. Another owed a hundred owed measures of wheat, and he gets a 20% discount. Why? Once the master has given him the boot, these men will then welcome this for former steward into their homes. This is especially something to consider that it's not just these two examples that Jesus gives in the parable, but this man takes every one of his master's debtors and does this. He's making friends for himself by unrighteous man, and he is using his master's wealth unrighteously to make friends for himself so that once he's given the boot, then he'll have people to take care of him. The master's response to this he commends the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. What does it mean then when Jesus commends the unjust steward for his shrewdness? He explains, the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Well, the sons of this world, those are unbelievers. Those are the ones that think this life here is the only life that there is. And so they pursue what they want with cunning and reckless abandon. They're keen in their business and in their personal lives. They seek their own advantage in every situation. And they do what's expedient, even if it be wrong and even if it outwardly appear lawful, they have no qualms about doing such things to increase their wealth and their reputations, as well as setting their competition and their enemies at a disadvantage. The sons of light, though, those are Christians. Jesus says in John 12, 36, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. That is, while you have me, the light of the world among you, and my teaching, believe me in my teaching, so that by faith you may be sons and daughters of the light. Jesus wants sons of the light, that is, Christians, to learn from this, from the sons of the world. But that doesn't mean that we're to emulate the sons of the world in every way. In fact, since it's Christ Jesus who tells us this in the parable that he commends the unjust steward for his shrewdness, we have to purify that term of all of its sinful and worldly connotations. Because when we hear shrewdness, especially in this example of business dealings, it has the connotations of moral compromise, deception, falsehood, getting things in a legal way that outwardly appears right, but is still damaging to one's neighbor. All of these must be purified so that we truly understand what Jesus means when he tells us to imitate this man's shrewdness. 
Jesus helps us understand that in Matthew chapter 10, 16. He sends the 12 disciples out to the villages, in the people of Israel, to preach to them. And he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. The word translated wise there in Matthew 10, 16 is the same word that Jesus uses to describe the activity, the shrewdness of the manager. It means wise, smart, keen, and perceptive, thoughtful. It's also the same word that Jesus uses to describe the five virgins who are wise in the parable of the ten virgins, the ones who took oil in their vessels with their lamps as they waited for the bridegroom. This, I think, helps us purify the word shrewd of its unjust connotations. He is wise. He is keen. He's thoughtful in the ways of the world. The sons of light, however, are to be true in that way. They're to be harmless, as Jesus says, or rather innocent as doves, without the admixture of the bad motives, like deceit and cunning. Being innocent as doves, then, isn't just the absence of wrong, so that no one can make a case against you, but it also means that having a heartfelt goodness towards your neighbors as well. Jesus isn't therefore telling us to be shrewd in the worldly way so that we excuse moral compromise, falsehood, and deceit as long as it's for our good or for the good of the church. No, he's teaching us to be wise, to be thoughtful, and to be circumspect in a godly way, in a way in which we do not sin, in a way in which we look to use the gifts of God in a godly way. We are all stewards, after all. Each of us has been given a stewardship. Everything that we have is from the hand of God. David says this in the Old Testament lesson, which we heard just a bit ago. Both riches and honor come from you. And the Lord says in Deuteronomy 8, 18, that it is he who gives us the power to get wealth. And so all we have is a stewardship from him. And he gives it to us so that we may not waste our master's goods solely on ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't enjoy our master's goods that he gives to us. No, we most definitely get to enjoy the good things that God gives. We enjoy wealth. We enjoy honor. We enjoy the possessions and lifestyles that he has given to us. But we enjoy them in such a way that through them we may also do good to others. Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes 3. Nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, so that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Jesus calls wealth and riches unrighteous mammon because that's how the world so often treats it. The world uses it unrighteously. The Holy Spirit warns us throughout scriptures that money is a root of all evil. And that if riches do increase by God's grace, that we don't set our hearts on them. And Paul tells Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, he says, that they be rich in good works, ready to give and willing to share. And so whatever God has given us, we are to use for the benefit of of others as we have opportunities, since all we have is from God's gracious hand given to us as stewards to administer in a God-pleasing way. And the same is true for our vocations. The married person has the gift of a spouse, and so that spouse should be loved, honored, and cherished as such. And if God has not given a spouse, then that too is a stewardship from the Lord. St. Paul says in Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, that he who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord without distraction. To those who are married, and God has blessed them with the gift of children, which are a heritage from the Lord, to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord, for that is part of that stewardship. God graciously puts stewards over his congregations as well. Men whom he calls and ordains. Men who are to steward out his word and his sacraments according to Christ's institution. So St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 that people should consider us servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. 
And he goes on to say, it is required as stewards that they be found faithful. The office of pastor is a stewardship. Men are we to use his word in sacraments according to his institution, but so is your office as Christian and hearer of God's word. For God gives you his word as steward, so that you may hear it, read it, learn it, mark it, and inwardly digest it for your salvation and for your sanctification. And so we see that everything he gives us in life he gives us to use, to enjoy, and to administer for the good of those around him. And he wants us to be wise in how we administer our stewardships. And not wise in the ways of the world, but wise in the ways of Christ. Using the things that God has given us in love for one another. He wants us to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves in our stewardships. And so we use God's gifts, and we use the vocations that he's given to us to make friends for ourselves. We are to use God's gifts to help others, to serve our neighbors, so that when our stewardships come to an end on the day that we die, those whom we have helped will be there to receive us into an everlasting home, welcoming you as a friend into your heavenly dwelling. And in this stewardship, there is always the temptation to use it for selfish gain. It is always the temptation to lust after evil things as Israel did. That's why the epistle lesson is coupled with this parable today. Because it shows us the dangers, the same danger from the example of Israel's time in the wilderness. How did they use the stewardship that God had given them? They used their freedom from slavery in Egypt to worship other gods, to be sexually immoral, and to tempt Christ by their complaining against what he had given to them. And in each case, they were, they were thoroughly punished. Paul's point is, let him who stands, thinks he stands firm take heed lest he fall. The unjust steward, he thought he stood firm, and he suddenly fell by wasting his master's goods. The Israelites thought they stood securely in God's favor so that they could freely sin and still enjoy God's grace and favor. And how often did this false security cause them to fall into sin and to fall away from God's grace? Both ancient Israel and this steward in the parable today fell to the temptation to use their master's blessings unrighteously. And that is our temptation as well. But God is gracious and merciful to us, in that he provides always a way of escape for every temptation so that we may be able to endure it and bear up under it. St. Paul tells the Ephesians, and you and me, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord is your salvation and your sanctification in this life. And so beware the use of unrighteous mammon or any of his gifts with the shrewdness, to use them with the shrewdness of the sons of this world, only for your benefit and to the harm of your neighbor. The shrewdness of the sons of this world, that, that only for their benefit and the harm of their neighbor, that comes from a place of unbelief and a place of disregard for God's word. There isn't this, there's a need for this sort of shrewdness among the sons of light. For with David, they say in the intro, Behold, God is my helper, and the Lord is with those who uphold my life. God gives us our stewardships and our vocations so that we may help others as God so graciously helps us each day for his glory and for the benefit of those around us. So let us be wise in the wisdom that God graciously gives. Let us make friends with unrighteous mammon, or friends by using unrighteous mammon, rather. How? How? Whenever we have opportunity to do so, however the Holy Spirit guides, so that we may uphold the lives of others by our help and our encouragement and our generosity. And they may uphold our lives by their help, encouragement, and generosity as well. 
so that on the day when God calls you from this stewardship, those very same people may welcome you into your everlasting home. Amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord.